Ian, is it true that you are on holiday this week? Ian? Page 94, the Private Eye podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of Page 94. My name is Andrew Hunter-Murray and this week we're going to be talking to MD, privatised medical correspondent, about the state of the NHS and how it's reached the grand old age of 70. We'll also be talking to Francis Ween about murky goings on in electoral spending, specifically those that hit the headlines last week after the Leave campaign was found guilty of overspending on its campaign, but which Private Eye broke two years ago. But first, the NHS has been in the headlines a lot recently as it has just turned 70. Not only that, there is a new health secretary after Jeremy Hunt was shifted to the foreign policy brief. So, how exactly is it looking? I spoke to privatised medical correspondent Phil Hammond, a.k.a. MD, and I asked him, first of all, at the age of 70, how is the patient doing? It's still offering a version of universal health care, which I guess is what it was set up to do. So... Health for everyone according to need and not ability to pay. But I would say it's not really doing that anymore because we've got waiting lists above 4 million now. Uh, we're getting people with conditions like autism, mental health issues, uh, learning disabilities who were just flatly refused any care at all. My neighbour has just had to crowdsource £80,000 to fund a new leukaemia drug to stay alive, uh, which NICE says works but is too expensive for the NHS. It's widely available in European countries already. So I think it's... You know, we, we sort of love it. And as uh, uh, Nigel Lawson said, it's sort of a religion and heart to challenge. But we need to think very carefully about how we're going to sustain it. And I think we should compare it to other European countries. There are plenty of other European countries that provide universal health care. They just tend to do it through a mixture of social insurance, private insurance and a, a state safety net. Uh, but the big issue as ever is funding itself. If we put the same fraction of our gross domestic product into the NHS as the Germans have done into their healthcare system, since 2000, we'd have an extra £260 billion in the NHS. Uh, so it's not really how it's funded, it's how much it's funded that remains the biggest issue. And we've chosen to live in a low tax economy, and it's got massive implications, obviously for health, but for social care, for education, for policing, for everything else. So ultimately, it's our responsibility. We say we own it, but it's falling to pieces because we won't pay the tax to support public services. It's interesting um, reading your columns in the eye about how apparently small the differences in the numbers are. So, for example, uh, you mentioned that you know the average annual funding increase in the last 70 years has been 3.7%. Hmm. And what it needs, according to the Office for Budget Responsibility, is 4.3%. So it, it, it seems like a small difference between those. But obviously, as you say, it has enormous implications over time, especially at the sums that we're dealing with. Uh, yes, it does, because it still is, you know, the, the biggest investment that we put public funding into, you know, small percentage of large amounts have, make big differences and we'll never really be able to catch up by the damage done of all those years of underfunding. So even when we've tried to put more money in, as Blair did, he tried to match uh, European levels briefly, it's never really caught up. You know, the Germans have problems with people living older and lots of people with chronic diseases, but they don't have these huge queues in casualty. They don't have the ramshackle buildings. They don't have the, what I call the catnap uh, technology. Catnap is an acronym that stands for cheapest available technology, narrowly avoiding prosecution. <laughs> we use all these cheap things in the NHS computer systems, particularly. Uh, so, you know, investment over years in these services have made them streets ahead in terms of you know, how modern and clean and safe they are. And, and the NHS is just frayed at the seam. So small percentages over time is a lot, a lot of money. Uh, and we need to recognise that. So one of the aspects of the pay situation that you mentioned and this supposed uh, glut of money coming into the NHS for its 70th birthday is about the staff at uh, Bart's Health, which is the country's biggest NHS trust. And the non-clinical staff there, so for the, the people who cook and clean and do the portering, they are not going to benefit from this extra wadge of money. Is that right? It appears that way, yes. One of the disasters of, of subcontracting and outsourcing is that often people are then get removed from um, NHS terms and conditions that they would have kept if they'd stayed within the NHS. So a lot of people who uh, find their jobs outsourced don't necessarily get the incremental pay increases that they would have got if they remained within the NHS. Yeah. And it's one of the many dangers of outsourcing. Um, as Ian Hislop is fond of saying, uh, in my 30-odd years at Private Eye, I've never understood that outsourcing is the answer to anything. It's uh, usually uh, devolves and passes the buck, passes responsibility onto people who are obsessed with profit, uh, and the workers aren't protected, and that's just one example of it. 
Yeah, so it's quite striking because these jobs at Bart's Health, they've been outsourced to Circo, Elior and Synergy Healthcare. And that's been the case for nearly two years now. So as a result, uh, they're going to get the London living wage, but there's going to be no benefits, for example, things like NHS equivalent pay or, you know, things dealing with leave or sick pay or things like this. So that's people who are working in the NHS and yet aren't receiving any of the benefits of any increase in NHS funding. Yes, and even more importantly, they're often the lowest paid workers. These are the people who glue the NHS together, who are struggling to survive anyway, and they're the ones who most need the pay increase. So it's an absolute double whammy, and it's a disgrace. And the I and other media outlets are are absolutely right to keep highlighting it. Uh, You know, you can't outsource people's uh, jobs Often they have no control over that outsourcing. The decision is made for them and then they're having their terms and conditions taken away from them uh, and it's completely unacceptable. Is the habit of outsourcing partly connected to the state of the, as it's called, the internal market in the NHS? Are they related? Well, partly and there's also the ideology. I think, to be honest, most politicians, but particularly conservative ones, when they say they love the NHS, they mean they'd love it off the books completely. We'd love not to have responsibility for it because it causes so much headache. So outsourcing is one way of getting rid of some of that. And yes, clearly the legislation started um, by Margaret Thatcher, accelerated by Tony Blair, and then hugely accelerated by Andrew Lancey's Health and Social Care Act, uh, forces purchases in this new market system to put contracts out to the market uh, and obviously private companies can bid for it and we have this absurd situation now particularly in community care where contracts have to be retended every few years so there are absolutely there's this, this, this mad cycle of uh, commissioning and recommissioning and tendering and retendering that uh, takes up a huge amount of money and time and effort and management consultancy fees to prepare the bid and lawyers fees and accountancy fees And it's been estimated about £4.5 billion uh, of money that could go into patient care is put into this ridiculous market system. So that's one of the things clearly that needs to go. We need to rediscover uh, the NHS as a public service, and that will need further legislation. The NHS reinstatement bill is actually crucial to returning the NHS to a public service that's publicly run, publicly paid for, publicly provided and publicly accountable, which it clearly isn't at the moment. So some people would say, I presume the people who advocate this whole system would say that, well, the whole point about this tendering system is that you'll actually end up saving more than £4.5 billion. Yes, that would be the argument. But in a sense, it's, I mean, it's not a level playing field. When things are put out to tender, people are allowed to cherry pick the aspects of care that they want to provide. Uh, as we've seen in Barts, they're allowed to, to short circuit NHS terms and conditions in the hope of saving money. You know, if you could provide clear evidence that outsourcing retain the the same level of scrutiny, the same accountability, the same inspections, the same obligation to give data up for for monitoring and the same terms and conditions of the staff. And through doing that, you provide a better service for the same money, then that's absolutely fine. We should be led by the evidence. But the issue with the outsourcing is it hasn't been evidence led. It's been ideologically led. uh, And a lot of the outsourcing hasn't delivered savings. It hasn't delivered better care, and when it doesn't work, um, the private company just hands back its contract saying, I can't provide this anymore, and the NHS has to pick up the pieces again. So I think the evidence base for it, which is what we should all be looking at, is pretty poor. Can we just go a bit more into the mechanics of how exactly, as a, a private healthcare provider, you can cherry-pick these easier operations? What, what, what's the whole procedure? It's, does it start with a contract being offered in the first place? Yes, it's all done as a contract. And some people would argue it's entirely appropriate for them to cherry pick easier cases because they don't have the safety backup for the more complex cases. In a, in a simplified example? Well, you would just take, so for example, if you're doing uh, operations of hips or hernias or whatever, you would take the ones that don't have multiple comorbidities, as I say, the ones who don't have other complex conditions. So the ones that are likely to have uncomplicated anaesthesia and are likely to get up and recover and get out of hospital very quickly. Uh, Now, if you're going to do that and you're going to say we think it's safe and appropriate to do so and the NHS doesn't have the existing capacity and it will get waiting times down, then there should be a differential tariff. The complicated cases should be paid far more because they're far more complicated to do and are likely to have longer hospital stays and complications. But traditionally that hasn't happened. The way we've commissioned care, they've done it at a flat rate. So that's the way generally that the cherry picking is done. It's actually all agreed by contract. And then the private contractors fiercely 
um, impose their contracts. So what generally happens in the NHS is if you miss something out of a contract, you suddenly realise there's an extra bit of stuff that needs to be done. Then usually a GP will do the extra work without any pay, grumbling a bit. Right. What happens in the private sector is if at the commissioning side you've written a contract and you've missed a vital piece out, they say, tough, hard luck, I'm not paying for that unless you pay me more. So it's a completely different culture. And you could say, welcome to the real world NHS. Um, but the whole process of the contracting and the tendering and the legal fees and the management consultancies and the accountancy fees, that in its sense, I don't think has been recovered by any of the efficiencies uh, that may have been saved. So it's not saying let's not have innovation, let's not collaborate with the private sector where it's appropriate, but just do it in an evidence-based way where there is clear benefit. Uh, and I think we've had enough commissioning now in the NHS to suggest we haven't really had the benefits, which is why even Simon Stevens and Jeremy Hunt, when he was health secretary, were rowing back on Lansley's reform, saying this contractual mess and outsourcing is a disaster. It's taking up loads of time. It's splintering services. They're not getting better. Let's try and join everything up in accountable care organisations. So I think even the top of the NHS have realised that this hasn't worked and it's time to stop it. It is kind of extraordinary, just to go back to that contract point, you can bid on a let's say hernia operations in a particular area and you can say we will take hernia operations but we won't take any which feature these extra complications i mean the other danger is that you take on more than you can safely do so sometimes you know the shiny bright things of virgin or whatever might say oh, we can take on all the child protection work or we can take on this and we can take on that and they give such an impressive uh, presentation uh, and then they find, golly, this stuff's really tough. They're going to have to nick the existing NHS staff and get them to work for them to do the contract if they win it. And they rather ambitiously think they can turn it into a, a, a you know, a break even or a profitable venture and find that they can't. So I think you have the other thing where they don't cherry pick. They just say, oh, yes, we can do that. We can do that. And then find out that they can't at the last minute. I mean, all of this sounds like a, a similar charge that was leveled against the banking system after the financial crisis, which is that profits are privatised and losses are not. Losses are allowed to remain in the public sector. Yeah, I think that's true. But I also think there isn't really isn't much profit to be made uh, out of the NHS. So when people go on about the NHS being privatised, certainly the legislation is there for private companies to come in and hoover up more care. And they certainly have done that with community contracts and private care is certainly on the increase. But it's nowhere near the majority of NHS care provided by private outsourcing because there isn't the money in the system. The private companies look at it and they say, the UK is terrible in the way that it funds its public services. There's no margin there. There's no point in us taking this on. So rather bizarrely, although the Conservatives would like to outsource more and the private sector to be involved more, the fact that they've been so parsimonious in the amount of money they put into the NHS means that actually a lot of private companies have walked away and said, well, we'll just carry on providing private health care because as the NHS collapses, that's where the big growth will be. People taking out their own private insurance, you know, companies paying for employees because they need to get them back to work. Or as happened in my community recently, people having to outsource for their cancer treatment, sorry, to crowdfund for their cancer treatment because they couldn't get it on the NHS. So in a sense, there's no cream left to skim off. I don't think there is, no. No, and I was very taken. I spoke to a group of cancer specialists recently and I said to NHS professors uh, and heads of their units, I said, how many of you have private health insurance? And pretty much all of them put their hands up. They said, look, there are some pretty amazing advances now in cancer care, but we're not confident the NHS will be able to afford them. So us as cancer specialists are taking out private insurance because uh, we don't think the NHS can afford it. And I think when you get that level of inside knowledge, you realise uh, the parlous state we're in. But We'll always have the NHS, but I think increasingly uh, some of the best care will only be provided privately. You mentioned briefly there the change in personnel we've had at the very top of the NHS. Uh, Jeremy Hunt, after six years as Health Secretary first and then as Health and Social Care Secretary, has gone. How do you think his report card looks? I think he had a grim, a grim staying power, uh, such as, you know, as Theresa May has grim staying power. <laughs> and you could admire that in a sense. He wanted the job. He got to know his brief. He did things you probably don't know. He would visit hospitals at um, unsocial hours and roll his sleeves up and scrub the floors. And He did the rounds. He got on top of his brief, but he was stuffed by two things recently. Uh, basically, the first is that it was a period of austerity, so the underfunding in the NHS meant every single important indicator of quality and safety has gone backwards. We now have you know, over 4 million people on waiting lists. We saw the queues in corridors, not just in Christmas, but in the months running up to Christmas. We're 100,000 staff short in the NHS. 
uh, and they're having to just stop counting some waiting times because they they can't possibly hit them, so they're just not measuring stuff now. So all those indicators of quality and safety went backwards. But he professed himself to be a patient safety champion, so he tried to to pass the buck for the running of the NHS onto Simon Stevens at NHS England and saw himself as a self-styled patient safety champion. He would deliver a seven-day NHS. He would be the new Nye Bevan who took on the junior doctors. And uh, that bit particularly blew up in his face because uh, he realised you can't actually have patient safety if you haven't got safe uh, staffing levels. Uh, and he wasn't in a position then to, to implement safe staffing levels. In fact, he said the manpower crisis is the biggest issue facing the NHS. We don't have the staffing. And I wish I'd known that at the beginning. Well, he, I'm sure he was told he just didn't have the funding then. So belatedly, we are increasing staffing uh, numbers. We are increasing numbers at medical school. We've got a 3% rise in the NHS, which is better than the 0.9% rise that we've had in funding. But it's not really enough. And he, he just carried the brief but if you actually think hard about what he actually achieved, I would say very little. So to sum up, if we can, <laughs> the health of the, the NHS now that it's 70, it sounds like there have been some improvements. I mean, you've, you've been a bit, obviously, you're very cautious about them and you've, you've said it's not enough. It sounds like there are some improvements, but there's a lot more needed. Well, it's a very British, it is. The NHS is a great British mess, but you can say the same of Brexit or our educational system or our legal system. There's a strong sense of make, do and muddle uh, in all our public services. Um, I would argue there's very strong evidence that the better your level of education, the better your health. So you could argue that education needs extra funding as much as possible if we could adopt the Finland approach and take the top 5% of graduates and pay them really well because teachers are the future uh, and invest in education. Actually, that might close the inequality gap and improve health more than anything else. So I think we need to take a wider view of health but also we need to have that public conversation if you really say you love your public services uh, that's not compatible with a low tax economy so irrespective of how how services are paid for it's how much and i think we need to take that 70th birthday opportunity uh, to talk about funding you know the dream of cross-party <laughs> Uh, agreement and allegiance on this and giving us, you know, a, a, a real sense of what we've agreed to pay. And yeah, by all means, explore other funding models. I'm a fan of central taxation. I think it's the fairest progressive taxation. But by all means, you know, don't don't be completely blind to what other countries are doing. I think we should examine the best of all countries. And, and if there are different systems that might work, then pilot them and see if they can work here. Uh, so it is muddling on. The staff are amazing. But I, I think we've seen the end of universal care. I think increasingly now people aren't all getting the care they need across all ranges of conditions. They're either being denied care completely. So my lovely aunt, who has a rapid cycling mood disorder um, and strong suicidal thoughts every day, has had her community psychiatric nurse withdrawn uh, because they say it's no longer appropriate. And they sent her a letter saying, uh, we realise that this will increase your risk of suicide and self-harm. So you've actually got providers now saying, look, we haven't got the staff. We're prepared to accept the risk that some of our patients will kill themselves because we just can't fund universal care. And I think those marginalised conditions, particularly mental health, you know, autism, learning disabilities, I think people are really, really struggling there. I think we need to rediscover the dream of universal care uh, and properly fund it and be quite brutal about the failings in the NHS as well as its successes uh, because we're only going to improve if we can be honest about the failures too. Phil Hammond. Now it's time for another episode on our occasional I Told You So strand. Two years ago, Private Eye ran a story about spending anomalies in the Leave campaign during the Brexit referendum. Now there has been a huge result delivered. The Vote Leave campaign has been fined tens of thousands of pounds, and so too has the man at the centre of the whole curious story. I started off by asking Private Eye's Francis Ween exactly who this man was. My attention was drawn, as we say, to the fact that a funny little fellow, a 22-year-old called Darren Grimes, had been given £675,000 in the week before the referendum. And he was registered, he'd registered himself a couple of months earlier with the Electoral Commission as a participant in the referendum campaign. Uh, and he ran a little thing he'd set up called Be Leave, uh, you know, believe, get it? So you know, he was odd until a year earlier. He was an active Lib Dem and a pro-European, and I'm not quite sure what happened in the year before the referendum. But he suddenly became a conservative and a, a, a get, get out of Europe person. He obviously saw Nigel Farage's face, and he was a believer. <laughs> uh, but anyway, he um, 
Got so which, he, he, he registered re- himself, little Darren Grimes. Yes, registered participant. What 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 is that? Well, just anyone, Status. any anyone who wanted to um, either give any money or receive any money in the context of the campaign needed to register with so all sorts of people. You know, Eddie Izzard and and lots of groups. There were endless front groups for Aaron Banks called Grassroots Out, and there was you know. The Go. There were lots of different Go groups. Oh yes, you, you um, listed them actually. There was Business Go, Labour Go, Northern Ireland Go, Steel Go. Yeah, yeah. So these were separate groups which were part. They weren't officially part of the either the official campaign, which was a Vote Leave, That's or right. Aaron Banks's campaign, Leave dot EU. No. Well, it, there was a lot of um, uh, yeah, a lot of jostling around because of the spending limits, because the official campaigns, that's Vote Leave and Remain, had a limit of, I think, five million quid. But then each other campaign could have spend up to £700,000. So as the referendum approached, Vote Leave was getting up to its spending limit. So it had to find a way of offloading some of its money so it didn't break the rules. And magically, a week before the referendum, it gave 625,000 to this 22-year-old fashion student in Brighton and another 50,000 went to him from a, a vote leave supporter a man called Clark so suddenly this 22-year-old fashion student was officially sitting on 675 grand and it was registered with the electoral commission and it, bizarrely it was under his name rather than believe it was actually Darren Grimes in person and he says that's because he filled out the form wrongly and put his name in the wrong place but the electoral commission said they did actually check with him that he wanted to be registered individually rather than as believe, and so I was just curious to know what on earth. Well, a it looked very fishy. It looked as if Vote Leave had obviously been trying to get round the spending limits by giving this twenty-two-year-old um, fashion student this vast sum of money, um, and uh, so I got in touch with him. And I tracked him down via Facebook. I found his Facebook page was full of photos. Uh, he'd just been celebrating his 23rd birthday in Cambridge uh, with some pals. And they'd obviously had a rather riotous time. Uh, and I tried to resist the temptation to think, oh, I wonder if um, any of that money helped towards the birthday celebrations. But of course it didn't, because actually, as we now know, it was sent directly to um, a Canadian company, company called Aggregate IQ, which was a sort of Canadian um, marketing, advertising uh, type thing involved in the referendum, which Leave, Vote Leave were using. And they just um, uh, nominally gave the money to Darren Grimes, but in fact passed it straight to this Canadian firm. So he didn't really get his hands on it, poor fellow. Uh, but he did, um, when I, I got in touch with him, and I said, well, this is a bit odd. Why why have you uh, suddenly, why are people suddenly giving you hundreds of thousands of pounds? And he said that he'd received it in a standard legal way, a very odd standard way, uh, and he'd reported it according to the rules, and uh, all will be declared and made transparent through the Electoral Commission, uh, which it jolly well wasn't. Um, It's taken two years for it to be declared and made transparent, and it's partly the fault of the Electoral Commission themselves, because they were amazingly incurious about all this, even after we'd done the piece and then other papers picked up on it. Uh, The Electoral Commission said it would investigate him. And then, here we are, November 2016, uh, they said they've undertaken inquiries of uh, Vote Leave and Mr Grimes. Uh, We concluded our inquiries and found no evidence that Darren Grimes and Vote Leave worked together in a way that broke the law. So there was no need to open a full investigation and no further action was taken. That was in uh, November 2016. And now, July 2018... They find Vote Leave and they find Darren Grimes, 20,000 fans, saying that they've suddenly found significant evidence of coordination between him and Vote Leave, uh, which, you know, if he was in coordination with them, then his money should count as their money. But uh, that was the whole point. They had to pretend to be separate entities. Uh, but it's taken them two years, having initially just glanced at it and said, no, no, no need for investigation. It all looks all looks above board to us, <laughs> this little chap in Brighton getting hundreds of thousands of quid. And this was the other thing, the, the Be Leave campaign that Grimes was running, um, did a little bit of campaigning. Tiny bit, there was yes. a, you know, There was a Twitter feed, there were a few photos, there was a Facebook page. That's right. But the, the logo was identical to the Vote Leave logo. Yes, it was. Um, it wasn't exactly a great big national campaign. <laughs> I think it's, it's, um, its biggest achievement, actually, was to have a huge dinner in Dover on the eve of the referendum uh, at a hotel in Dover. Um, there's a receipt... Uh, for about 400 and something pounds that they had this dinner, which was some, I think it was about 20 or 21 of his mates from Vote Leave. Uh, Where is it? I've got the 
here we are, the, the receipt here for their dinner. Uh, <laughs> is this trio the... of fish cakes, the Ramada, the Ramada Inn at Dover, trio of fish cakes, tomato basil soup, chicken ticker, gravid lax, wood pigeon, kingfish curry, roasted vegetable parcel, I think that might have been Darren, I think he might be a vegetarian, asparagus and wild mushroom, rack of lamb, and then no fewer than nine eight-ounce sirloin steaks, plus another three eight-ounce fillet steaks, and, and a ribeye steak coming to £461. And that, as far as I can see, was the entirety of Believe's output, its expenditure. Francis, how did you get hold of that receipt? What's the, where's that from? Well, I think he had to register it, didn't he? Um, right, as campaign expenditure. Uh, as something like that, yes. It was their, their, you know, their outgoings as well as their incomings have to be registered. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, he's now been landed with uh, a fine of 20,000 quid by the Electoral Commission. So he might rather wish he had hung on to some of that money yeah. <laughs> because he's uh, going to struggle to raise it, I think. And Inspector Nacker is taking an interest. They've reported him to the police as well. So there might be further developments. You know, he may yet find himself uh, being charged with something. And that £675,000, that was spent in the final 10 days of the campaign once it had been transferred via Grimes to Aggregate IQ. Yes, it was sent to the Canadian company Aggregate IQ. And used for what online used, marketing? used for online advertising and marketing okay. targeted advertising stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, hurling it at Facebook, the usual thing. We should say that the the other person reported is uh, an official from Vote Leave, David Hulsall. He's been reported too, and Vote Leave itself was fined sixty one thousand pounds. Yeah, Vote Leave was given its fine more for being thoroughly unco- uncooperative than for the fact that it was engaged in this skullduggery with Darren Grimes, uh, because the Electoral Commission when it finally got round to investigating, was rebuffed all the time. It kept writing to vote leave saying, could we talk to you about this? And their letters went unanswered and nobody spoke to them. And so they issued a very severe statement last week saying that the the fine has been made that much higher because they were so uncooperative. Meanwhile, vote leave was saying, oh, we never had a chance to state our case. The Electoral Commission wouldn't listen to us. You think, well, they wouldn't listen to you because you refused to talk to them, you silly idiots. <laughs> What prompted the Electoral Commission to get involved after they had initially said, no, it's all above board, in November 2016? Well, I think pressure, the constant banging on. I mean, certainly I banged on about it, and I think BuzzFeed uh, got quite keen on the story, and one or two papers kept returning to this story and saying it's very, very odd. And then as more and more came out about other strange goings-on uh, over the last year or so. You know, there's been an awful lot of other things about vote leave that have emerged in The Observer and elsewhere. Uh, t- and indeed, this firm Aggregate IQ, uh, not to mention Cambridge Analytica and all that sort of murky world. And so as more and more came out, I think it just got to the point where the Electoral Commission, even they, had to accept that perhaps it was worth um, uh, casting an eye over all this. And they've now um, uh, reached their verdict. So we await the results of Inspector Nacker. Yes, although, I mean, Darren, I mean, apart from the fact that he's got to pay a £20,000 fine and he uh, is being investigated by Inspector Nacker, he's done very well out of it because, as I say, he was this 22-year-old fashion student no one had ever heard of. And on the strength of his believe activities and um, the rest of it, he's raised his profile a lot. I think he even turned up on Question Time recently and he was given a job soon after the referendum by Brexit Central, a sort of continuity vote leave, this sort of paramilitary wing of vote leave. And uh, he's since then got a, an even better job with the Institute of Economic Affairs, which is a very um, venerable, ancient right-wing think tank. Uh, so he's almost gone respectable, if you oh, call well, the IEA respectable. Congratulations, Darren, eh? Yes. He's such a funny little chap. He looks about 12, but then you think, well, he is only about 12. Francis Wayne there. Right, that's it for this episode of Page 94. We will be back again in two weeks with another episode. Thank you so much for listening to this one. We will see you again. Goodbye.